our global civilization is amazing, but can we count on it to continue? What are the fundamental supporting structures? What is really uh, everything we do based on? Well, maybe a lot of things, but one of the fundamental defining factors is certainly energy. Our energy sources and the way we use energy define not only what machinery we can or cannot use, but it defines actually the shape of the society that we organize or we can even imagine. This is episode two of the What is the Question podcast. And here we are with Hannes Sjoblad. Welcome, Hannes. Hi, David. How are you today? I am pretty well uh, with a nice uh, cup of tea in my hand, uh, having survived some uh, traffic mishaps, as it happens uh, too often to some of us. I actually don't commute, uh, or rather my commute is a bit strange. I commute every couple of weeks between New York and Europe. So uh, uh, when people say, wow, that is a big commute, I tell them there are a lot of people who commute every day one or two hours, so mine is actually easier. <laughs> it certainly sounds so. And just in this uh, first sentence, you already touched upon energy in a couple of dimensions. I mean, it's energy that is pulling our traffic. It's energy that heated your tea. And uh, so energy is certainly... The easy access to energy is what enables this modern society that we engage with every day. And, uh, uh, of course, uh, Earth uh, receives uh, sun's energy. I, I joke sometimes and say, well, solar energy is not renewable, actually, or sustainable that much. Only four billion years and uh, the sun will turn into a red giant and we will have to look for another source. Um, yeah, but uh, if we speak of solar energy, I don't think we should limit ourselves to our closest sun. So in principle, I would consider solar energy, even in the longer term, to be a, an unlimited ultimate energy source. And this is really how I would like to, to kick off our conversation because... We speak about all these different energy sources that we have. We have carbon and nuclear and fossil and whatnot. But there are the ultimate energy sources, right? Which is, in my view, uh, solar energy. And we have geothermal energy, which is the temperature difference that our planet is warm and that we can harvest pretty much as much energy as we want out of it. And the third is, of course, energy from the moon, the tidal energy that we will also never run out of as long as we have oceans here that can capture this water. Um, our knowledge uh, increases uh, about how the universe works. And the more we know, the better we can understand and capture these uh, energy sources. Um, a couple of thousand years ago, the only source of energy that we could really harness was burning some wood um, to heat and, and, and cook um, and the muscle energy for moving stuff around uh, whether through um, domesticated animals, um, horses and, uh, and, 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 and cattle, uh, or uh, human muscle energy from volunteers or slaves. Um, it has been a couple of thousand years, uh, so not a fast uh, transformation, but now we are uh, to the point where we can actually um, uh, use mechanical um, contraptions whose energy is coming from uh, either electricity or fossil fuels. And, and I think that is a pretty big deal. Yeah. Um, I mean, the story of human civilization is intimately tied to the energy sources that we can access. So exactly as you point out, it started out with the only energy we could have were, was our own muscles, right? And the food we could uh, it, this was related to how much calories we could intake and then we could carry heavier loads. And over time, we also managed then to engage with what we could call extrasomatic energy sources, simply sources that are outside our body. Uh, other animals, muscles, 
uh, firewood uh, and ultimately cracking atoms. Um, but this is what is enabling technological progress and civilizational progress. It's very much the amount of energy that we can harness for our different activities. Uh, as well as uh, the balance of energy input and energy output in a in a process, um, the 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 measurement of uh, the EROI, the energy return on investment or on energy invested, um, when uh, uh, oil uh, fossil fuels uh, were uh, discovered, whether in the Middle East or in Texas. Uh, it was pretty amazing. You just poked uh, the, the the sand or the, the the fields, and oil started gushing out. Uh, you actually had to uh, invest effort uh, to regulate uh, the outflow and to make sure that only it would come out when you wanted, rather than just uh, uh, being uh, um, flushed uh, all over the place. And the energy balance there was one to 200, something like that. So you invested one unit of energy and you received 200 units of energy out. There is a beautiful story about uh, how the oil industry in the Western Caspian uh, started out in, in, uh, in what today is Azerbaijan in Baku. And did you know, David, that it was in fact the, the two older brothers of the great Swedish inventor Alfred Nobel. They were traveling in, in the region uh, in the middle of the uh, 19th century and they came upon uh, oil uh, literally coming out of the ground. And they saw, okay, this is very interesting. We can use it for, for combustion systems. And they, they found a local landowner, some uh, sultan, and asked uh, him if they could buy the land. They said, yeah, this is terrible land. You can't grow anything on it. And it poisons the animals. So please take it. And then they started, uh, you know, literally using shovels, uh, just putting this oil into uh, skin sacks carried on the backs of donkeys uh, to get it out. And... Then it evolved, of course, into a more industrial processing. But it was not that long ago, really, that people had this perspective on oil. And um, that is a that is a fun story I didn't know. Uh, I read um, a novel uh, a few years ago called Absurdistan <laughs> that tells the story of a post-Soviet collapse uh, oil industries uh, in those regions. It is a hilarious uh, novel of. Uh, comical um, corruption and, and criminal enterprises. We'll put that in the notes for people who want to read about the podcast. We have some book uh, tips and articles to share on these topics. Um, talking about uh, oil and, and, and the role of, of, of oil, um, there is a very interesting uh, difference in the price of oil uh, or gas for for cars, uh, even even more, in Europe and in the in the U.S. And I've been thinking about uh, the fact that um, yes, uh, fracking uh, more recently uh, uh, created a larger oil supply and a natural gas supply in the U.S., but still a lot of oil is imported from the Middle East. And that kind of uh, logistical uh, process is secured by military investment and military expense, about a trillion dollars per year. And so the price of oil in the US is subsidized at the tune of a trillion dollars per year and the American taxpayer believes that they are paying gas very cheaply without taking that into consideration. So I, I find it pretty, pretty uh, amusing. Yeah, but this, David, didn't uh, the oil or gas prices were different uh, between Europe and uh, the U.S. already when I first visited U.S. in the uh, 1980s, I recall that the price for a gallon in the U.S. was equal to a price for a liter uh, of oil in or gas in Sweden. Yeah, it, it, in, in Europe, the taxes are uh, explicitly uh, accounted for and accumulated at the gas station. So um, this, this is true in many things. 
in the U.S., uh, when you buy a, a candy uh, or a coffee, uh, the prices that are displayed are without taxes, while in Europe, uh, by law, uh, every consumer price has to include taxes. True. But David, I would like to discuss with you really how technology and energy goes hand in hand and how this is taking us into a, a different future. What are the trends you see in terms of energy usage that are enabling you know, the next step in human evolution and uh, human society and uh, civilization? Well, uh, one of the most uh, beautiful exponential trends that we are seeing today is um, the uh, exponential decrease of the cost of uh, solar energy per kilowatt hour produced. Uh, since the seven, uh, 70s, when uh, solar photovoltaics uh, has been invented, this um, represented a, an ever-decreasing curve to the point where today, uh, without any subsidies and incentives, solar energy is competitive compared to carbon or oil in more and more places around the world. And uh, every week or month we hear about new long-term contracts uh, at uh, incredibly low wholesale prices uh, that are guaranteed by eager uh, industries um, with uh, respect to various bids, uh, and and it is uh, an unstoppable trend that is going to um, pretty rapidly over the course of the next um, couple of uh, decades um, profoundly transform um, transportation, agriculture, industry, and society as a whole. Yes, let me ask. So, yeah, I, I mean, this, so the trends in, in solar energy are obvious, but what will they really enable? What, how will transportation be different because we will have so much cheaper energy? Together with self-driving cars, um, I think they would deserve an episode by themselves and, and probably we will have one. Uh, I see the cost of transporting uh, one kilo of atoms or, or one pound of atoms decreasing by something between two and three orders of magnitude. And by the very simple supply and demand uh, balance, we will see transportation increase by two, three orders of magnitude because we will be able to economically transport things that we wouldn't think of moving today especially the fact that uh, uh, a human-shaped uh, uh, piece of meat will not need to be uh, in the driver's seat uh, will change a lot of things. At the same time, uh, I mean, we're going towards a, a, a more digital future and, and, and a dematerialized future. Why will we even need to be shipping stuff in the future, David, if, if we're dematerializing stuff? Not necessarily, and I don't necessarily have the answer, even though, you know, uh, some um, material sources will be uh, differentiated uh, around the planet. Uh, going back to solar, I think this is one of the important components, contrary to oil and carbon uh, that are localized sources, sun is available all over the place. Uh, it is decentralized. So, people will be able by installing um, solar photovoltaic panels to become energy independent and establish a new kind of conversation. You know, in Europe, uh, nation states uh, try to raise their voices and say, hey, Russia, you shouldn't do X or Y. And, and uh, Putin says, oh, winter is coming. Isn't that too bad? <laughs> Would you like some gas? Would you like some gas? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> True. So, but ultimately, yes, we're, we're seeing a future where energy production uh, is becoming distributed. It's definitely a paradigm of the network society. At the same time, I'm sitting here in Sweden. It's uh, in the afternoon and it's pitch dark. And certain places in the world do not have the same capacity to generate solar energy, of course, as to... 
uh, others. I, um, I think that digitization of uh, energy transfer coupled with the blockchain is going to be amazingly interesting. Um, with my uh, investment firm, Network Society Ventures, we just uh, uh, recently closed an investment in a South African firm called the Sun Exchange, which has a crowdfunding platform that uh, enables anybody to own the title to a single solar cell uh, for $10 or so, or multiple cells, and to uh, gain the advantage of these being put in a plant that when installed together with a smart meter enables the measurement of the local energy use uh, to be paid uh, to the owner of the cell uh, as a, a 10 year yield of that asset with a direct Bitcoin payment. So you can be literally sitting in Sweden where it's dark now and be streaming African sunshine in your digital wallet. That sounds like a beautiful vision. Now I just I can wish to stream it on my my payloads as well. Uh, I guess I have to wait with that until summer comes. Um, but David, I'm also uh, interested in hearing how this uh, approaching energy abundance will affect how we also transport ourselves out of the planet because that is definitely a restricting factor to the development of the space industry today. The fact that it costs so much energy to lift uh, matter out of uh, our uh, planet's gravity well and out into space. Um, definitely the energies that we are uh, looking at when we look at not only uh, the very small steps that are making, you know, uh, just a few hundred kilometers uh, to reach the orbit of the International Space Station. Uh, uh, more energy is required to go into lunar uh, orbits. Uh, interplanetary orbits require even more. Um, if you look at uh, SpaceX, uh, uh, Elon Musk actually uh, is in the position to know better than anybody whether you can uh, electrify rocket launches. And he believes that still uh, the best uh, solution we have uh, is uh, uh, to fire our rockets with uh, uh, old style chemical uh, explosions. Now, once you are in orbit, solar and uh, 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 thermal nuclear, uh, rather than thermonuclear, uh, becomes uh, a, a possible source if you are patient. So, so maybe not for humans, but for robots, uh, uh, propulsion with uh, solar sails and the way that our uh, probes uh, um, uh, provide uh, energy to their communication systems uh, from um, very small amounts of uh, radioactive isotopes uh, generating the thermal energy that they need to then harvest. Uh, these are these are things that we already know how to do. Interesting. So uh, I I love this idea that you just put into my head of. of not firing uh, rockets by the use of, of chemis, uh, chemical reactions, but ultimately to have electrical rockets. Wouldn't that be nice? They would be absolutely quiet. There would be no huge cloud and no sound booms, and the acceleration could be controlled in a different way, um, especially if you, if you go for a more horizontal takeoff and not the vertical ones that we use for rockets today. Yeah, there is a DARPA uh, project uh, called uh, uh, a 100-year starship that I am part of. Uh, actually, the uh, project is not to design a, a starship, it's to design an organization that can stay on mission for the hundreds of years that uh, would be required uh, to reach the, the, the stars, uh, even the closest ones. Because uh, as uh, uh, an administration changes after an election, you cannot just write them off and say, oh, that was a project that the previous guys wanted, so I am not going to look at it anymore. You have to be on mission uh, and, and, and you cannot forget about them. But I had the chance of, of speaking uh, with um, uh, some professionals in the field, you know, uh, a former uh, director of the uh, European um, um, Space Agency. And he was telling me, 
uh, that the energy equation of uh, accelerating to speeds uh, uh, close to the speed of light, which would be necessary, um, the, um, the ecosystem that can support the life uh, of, a, let's say, a dozen people, uh, if you think of accelerations that are compatible with, with humans, so one or, or two G, not, not much more, in order to reach those speeds with those masses, we would need to harvest the entire energy budget of the planet for several years and then spend that energy just in the acceleration of that single starship. So that shows you that, that we still need to work on a lot of engineering and a lot of inventions in order to be able to, to uh, aim for those exciting missions. I would agree. Uh, and the obvious part of the equation, yes, we know that the energy we need to spend in order to accelerate uh, increases exponentially the closer we get to, um, uh, to light speed. Uh, but... Um, for me, the obvious part of that work is to reduce the mass uh, part of the equation. So ultimately, if we can travel uh, the universe uh, immaterially, as for example, in the shape of information or uh, electromagnetic uh, radiation or photons, like a radio signal, that is for me the only feasible way for, for us to really become a space faring civilization. Uh, the idea of you, monkeys in tin cans is is uh, humorous in comparison. It's it's kind of naive. Absolutely, we will look at look back uh, to the Hollywood movies and uh, our beloved uh, science fiction novels and 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 smile uh, condescendingly uh, while <laughs> while being encoded as neutrino radiation, uh, just traversing the universe and knowing everything, not just from the outside but from the inside as well, because. Uh, as you may know, neutrinos do not mm. interact with, with much. So as long as uh, you can do all that magic that we are alluding to, uh, being uh, encoded in neutrino uh, radiation is one of the best ways to, to travel in the universe. Indeed. And then uh, since neutrinos, they normally don't exactly, they don't interact with almost any other matter. We don't need that much energy to accelerate them uh, for long distances or, or to protect it uh, because uh, you know uh, if uh, you are on a ray of light or if you are a ray of light uh, anything that you smash against uh, will kind of kill you whatever killing means uh, at that point but uh, neutrinos uh, travel uh, unimpeded interestingly this line of reasoning is uh, being explored as we speak uh, yuri milner uh, a Russian investor who also invested in Twitter and Facebook and uh, other uh, startups uh, announced uh, last year uh, a, a, a project to send um, a minuscule, a microscopical uh, probe uh, that would be accelerated uh, with a laser beam. And exactly because it is so small and its mass is so small, um, a, a reasonably large but still manageable amount of energy uh, would be needed to achieve that kind of acceleration and final speeds close to the speed of light and then aim for Proxima Centauri and, and, and see what, uh, what would happen, what we could do. I like that latest part. Let's see what will happen. <laughs> I would love for, for just as we see the democratization in biotechnology in energy production we also want to democratize space travel and uh, the access to to you know shooting uh, whatever we want out into space that is that will be a, a new era for for humanity when we can completely democratize this and everyone every single school kid can send out their own atomic little space probes in all kinds of directions Yes, and, and then we will pretty fast we will discover if uh, the apparent silence of the universe is due to the fact that uh, everybody is afraid and whoever is uh, irresponsibly shouting uh, as a young uh, child <laughs> is uh, being disciplined by whoever <laughs> is waiting right. out there. We'll, we'll, we'll just spam the universe and see how it reacts. <laughs> exactly, exactly. This is the theme uh, of another wonderful book, uh, 
a, a Chinese uh, science fiction novel that has been translated uh, into English uh, recently uh, entitled The Three Body Problem. Greatly recommended as well. Right. Yes, it is. We'll post that in the notes after the, the pod. Now, back mm. to Earth. Uh, I wonder, what do you think about uh, nuclear energy? Do you think that uh, we should use it, we shouldn't use it, uh, nuclear fission, nuclear fusion? I think that it's most unfortunate that we have had uh, very much a, um, a moratorium on further nuclear research uh, here in Sweden. Sweden was very early uh, out in the atomic age. But uh, since the 1980s, uh, the government completely uh, halted any research on nuclear technology, which means that, at least here locally, we have missed out on later generations of much smarter uh, nuclear systems. Principally, I am not particularly fond of the um, uh, nuclear reactors that we use today. Yes, the energy is uh, excellent and it's, uh, we can generate lots of it in, in a single location. but The problem is the waste. And because of the very long timelines of nuclear waste, I mean, it, it will be absolutely lethal for, for humans and other biological life over hundreds of thousands of years. And um, both you and I who are uh, working to understand the future of what's going to happen, I think this is an uh, unfathomable time horizons. So I want us to discover some smarter ways to generate energy potentially fusion uh, before I can give my thumbs up to nuclear energy. Um, three, three observations there. One, uh, an alternative timeline, uh, an alternative history does not have a single design being favored to be adopted uh, by the U.S. and as a consequence being almost automatically adopted worldwide. The reason why the current reactors are the way they are is because the side effect of the reactors of producing uh, nuclear material was desirable by the U.S. military. That is the reason their design is like that. There are alternative designs that haven't been industrialized. The thorium cycle reactor, for example, that very simply doesn't produce the fissile materials that can be used in bombs. So why don't we help the Iranians develop the thorium nuclear reactor if they want nuclear energy, even though they have plenty of oil? Uh, they could uh, um, get a lot of funding and invest in becoming the leader in a kind of nuclear uh, uh, reactor that inherently cannot be used for building atomic bombs. Brilliant idea, David. We should pass it on up, upwards, right? The second observation is around fusion. Uh, we know fusion works. Just look at the sun. Uh, but we are accustomed to very quick breakthroughs. Uh, when uh, in the Middle Ages uh, people were building cathedrals, they were more patient, you know, uh, four or five hundred years would go by and they would keep building the cathedral until they were ready. Uh, here we are now with uh, uh, the joint uh, European uh, uh, fusion reactor and ITER, the next generation uh, fusion reactor, uh, 20, 30, 40 billion euros of investment and 20, 30 years of, of uh, project to achieve energy parity of input versus output, maybe a little bit of surplus, certainly not industrialization where once it, you are done, you can just build uh, dozens or hundreds of these and uh, you, you, you know what, what um, that would mean for the, the world's energy. And, and people are saying, wow, is this really useful? Can we really afford this? And uh, obviously uh, we must. We cannot give up. We, we must keep trying. The third observation that I want to make is a dark horse. In 1989, the two leading electrochemists of the time, Fleischmann and Pons, announced that they found an inexplicable reaction 
uh, in a little amount of uh, 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 heavy water, deuterium uh, uh, rich water, uh, with a palladium catalyst. And they called that reaction called fusion because they couldn't explain the amount of thermal energy generated in the reaction, basically the heating of the water, with any chemical uh, source. The energy was so much that the only way they could explain it is that uh, uh, atomic nuclei were uh, being transformed, they were, were fusing. Contrary to the official scientific experiments that I just mentioned, which happen at a million degrees or more, this was going on at room temperature. They made a big... So what happened, so what happened with cold fusion? Yes, we've heard the term spun around, but we still haven't seen it being used in real life settings. Well, they made a big uh, press event and uh, they were on the cover of every newspaper and, and magazine around the world. And then scientists very excitedly uh, in many different places tried to reproduce their results and they were unable to do so. So the enthusiasm turned to skepticism very rapidly. And for the past uh, 30 years, um, nobody can get funding to understand whether there is anything going on or Fleischmann and Pons were mistaken for some reason, even though they were uh, the, the leading experts of, of their field. With the exception of a few dozen crazy people that all around the world, from Russia to Japan to Italy uh, to the United States, and interestingly to Sweden, kept working at it. And but there is also an Italian scientist, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, uh, uh, who is working on, he, he, there are, uh, on cold fusion, who published some um, things quite recently. Andrea Rossi, is that the guy? Correct. He's an engineer, and uh, he's a very controversial figure because uh, he has been claiming many kinds of breakthroughs uh, without... Uh, independent uh, um, analysis. Yes, he doesn't share his data, right? Um, only to specific people under specific conditions. Uh, there is a Swedish uh, uh, journalist uh, called uh, Mats Levan. Mm -hmm. Mats Levan wrote a book, yes, who, about uh, this. Who originally with uh, New Technique uh, and, and then in a book uh, reported a lot about uh, uh, Andrea Rossi's uh, adventures. The title of his book is impossible, the impossible invention. And uh, um, actually, uh, November uh, 24, in a few days, uh, as we record this episode, November 24, 2017, is when Andrea Rossi uh, is uh, planning his next demonstration. So maybe in a month's time, uh, we will know that the future of the planet is uh, going Most to be exciting. very different because cold fusion, or as it is now called, low energy nuclear reactions, Lenner, uh, promise uh, the type of energy density and energy return on energy invested uh, of uh, nuclear fusion without the complications uh, of um, uh, harmful side effect of uh, very complex, uh, high temperature engineering, huge investments, these and could, dangerous radiation. Yeah. These could be tabletop devices uh, or even microscopic devices. And if we are able to um, make them real, uh, the uh, future of the world and possibly the universe will be very different. Okay, let's let's th keep our fingers crossed for. Uh, for Andrea Rossi, and um, let's yeah, let's see what happens. Well, and and, and many others. You know, he is uh, one of the most visible figures in the field. But there are many many other people who are also uh, looking at uh, this, and I am following uh, some uh, groups. Uh, maybe in a few weeks or months, uh, we will make some other. Um, uh, other announcements around this uh, theme as well, as well as uh, uh, reporting on how Andre Ross's uh, demonstration uh, went. 
energy is going to be a defining factor in the future of human civilization. Uh, and uh, I'm actually optimistic about the fact that uh, we are not going to run out of energy in order to fuel uh, our dreams and that we will be able to find sources that are uh, compatible with a biosphere, that are respectful of the environment, uh, and uh, that uh, human communities are going to be able to leverage uh, to achieve their goals. Exactly. And this comes back to where we started. There are indeed pretty much infinite, even mid-term and long-term energy resources that are available to us. And as the old saying goes, it's the fisherman with a small rod can only catch small fish close to the shore. But uh, we know that the great fish are out there and with just a better fishing equipment, we can catch them. So the only thing we really have to do is to build a little bit better uh, solar panels, a little bit better geothermal capturing devices, and a little bit better nuclear or uh, nuclear energy harvesting devices. And then, yes, we are breaking into a new uh, era in human civilization where we can access these pretty much unlimited energy sources. Uh, Hannes, uh, thank you very much for the conversation. Uh, we will make uh, the various notes of the books we mentioned. And we will take note of coming back and say, hey, how was the demo uh, that uh, we were planning to uh, look at uh, on November 24th? And I'm looking forward for the next uh, episode uh, and uh, the next conversation with you. Thank you, David. And thanks, everyone who's listening. We'll be in touch again soon. <laughs>